What is it you think of when you think of a tank? Tracks? Toilet? Armor? Something like this? You probably weren't thinking of this, were you? This doesn't look much like a tank, does it? With no turret, no big gun in the front, and a wheel pushing it from the back, this tank bears little resemblance to the armored behemoths of our modern day. From their origin as breaking blockades in World War I, the rapid expansion of tank applications in World War II was an indication of the rapid technological advancements that came with the 1900s. A global shift in the way wars were planned and fought, and a growing divide in the ways of thinking between the East and the West. The Mark I was developed by the British to break through trenches with few casualties, but others saw an opportunity in the Mark I that would change the nature of warfare forever. This is the first turret tank, the Renault FT. Made by the French towards the end of World War I, the Renault FT was sold to many countries including the United States, Spain, Belgium, and Sweden. Why have a turret? Well, it seems quite obvious now. Tanks weren't originally expected to fight other tanks. However, after combat between a German A7V and a British Mark I, about 20 yards apart, lasting a handful of minutes, military designers realized the necessity of tanks to have anti-tank weaponry. Now tanks were expected to fight other tanks, hence the need for firepower, armor, speed, and mobility, the largest factors of tank designs. After the conflict in World War I ended, the next conflict tanks were used in was the Spanish Civil War. This war proved to be the testing ground for many new ideas and designs. Here is one of the tanks tested in use, the BT-5. This was a Russian tank that was designed by the American inventor J. Walter Christie, whose design was rejected by the American military. Christie developed a suspension system using the BT-5 and later tanks like the Comet. The BT-5, a fast and light tank, contributed to the development of the guerrilla warfare doctrine involving tanks and wars beyond simple line breakers. The Spanish Civil War ended on April 1st of 1939, but one year later, the German Blitzkrieg offense in World War II displayed the power of fast moving tanks. The Blitzkrieg was a radical idea thought up by own Wall of Germany, and its use greatly affected the development of tank doctrines. Germany as a whole at the forefront of tank doctrine using their panzer forces created by Oswald Lutz. The panzer forces grouped up tanks into platoons, which would usually be paired with an infantry group as well. One issue with these groups was they would argue over which area of the battlefield should get the tank, creating tension between groups. The panzer groups used armored formations to gain ground, with the tanks shepherding in the troops similarly as in World War I, but with more efficiency in communication due to the introduction of radio. The Germans' effective use of tanks in the Blitzkrieg scared other nations into increasing their armored force. This resulted in many interesting stopgap tanks being rapidly produced. The tanks created by the United States in this time used whole mounted guns because they couldn't cast a turret big enough to house a 75mm cannon, instead putting it in the hole. This same issue resulted in the development of many similar tanks with open top designs. However, new lightly armored vehicles such as the M10, M18, M3 GMC, M3 Stewart, and more all began to change the developing United States doctrine. The M18 Hellcat especially represented the United States development doctrine of tank destroyers and their wolves. This new doctrine emphasized going directly to the enemy and attacking them there, representative in their motto, Seek, Strike, destroy. The M18 was the poster child of this idea, with extremely high top speeds and a powerful 76mm cannon. With these strategies, groups of M18 could react to any German pushes, quickly coming to the aid of troops in danger, engaging enemy tanks from all sides and wrecking havoc. The Germans and Russians, however, had different ideas about how to use best to use tank destroyers. Both of these nations used casemates, which retrofitted guns under existing tanks to make them more powerful. However, these modifications removed the turret. These tanks tended to be heavily armed as to fire at the enemy. These destroyers must always face the opposing tank. An example of a casemate is the Yad Panther, probably the most well known. The Germans used casemates increasingly as ambush vehicles as the Allies advanced in the German soil. Casemates were optimal ambushers due to their low profile, unrecognizable shapes. Although tank destroyers are no longer in use today due to modern MBTs, the doctrines they tested helped develop common tank doctrines used during World War II and beyond. The main tank doctrines of World War II largely followed what Germany had laid out with their panzer groups in the Blitzkrieg. However, those groups were used in varied ways throughout the nations. 
For example, the United States' high production rate of tanks allowed them to have many more than the crippled German industrial machine. Especially later in World, when Germans were running out of rubble and factories, this multitude of tanks allowed American forces to work together to take down the larger and arguably better German tanks. The American forces would do this by surrounding the German tanks and shooting them from all sides. Especially early war, American tanks couldn't always penetrate certain German tanks from the front compared to the German guns, which could rip through most American armor. Germans, on the other hand, had panzer divisions and self-propelled gun divisions, which split up main tanks. The panzer divisions were usually well trained in whatever tank they used, knew how to angle their tanks strategically and perform more complex maneuvers. One issue with German tank divisions, however, was logistics. Compared to the relatively light logistical train of American tanks, German tanks guzzled fewer and frequently broke down. This problem was especially prevalent with Tigers and hampered German doctrines because many tanks were not fully operational to take place in combat, often seeing solo Tigers go into battle due to various issues with the others in the division. The Russians, however, took the American approach to the extreme sending massive waves of tank and infantry to meet German attacks in Russia, which was able to do this through their use of T-34 and American tanks. The T-34s were rapidly produced using mass production methods taught by the Americans to the Soviets. Through this, the Russians rapidly spit out waves of T-34s, which could immediately go out to fight in the front lines. Russia also used American tanks they received through the Lend-Lease system. This system allowed the U.S. to distribute tanks to countries that needed them, so long as it benefited the defense of the United States. Russia happened to be one of these countries along with Britain, which paid back their debts for the system just recently in 2006. In 2022, a modern Lend-Lease Act was established to send equipment to Ukraine to assist in its defense against Russia. The United States rapidly developed new technologies for use in these tanks during the war, including stabilization in the US M4. A standard in modern tanks, this tech allowed the M4 to be more effective while on the move, increasing the potency of mobile spearheads. The British also helped along these developments by using the APDS, armor-piercing discard sapo, which increased the penetration of ammo. APDS would later evolve into APFSDS, armor-piercing fin-stabilized discard sapo, a modern and more lethal round. All of these new groundbreaking technology and ideas changed the war from the stagnant lines of World War I to constantly shifting lines. In one example, the Germans' use of tanks allowed them to push through the open fields of Ukraine and almost capture Moscow. Because of the tank's improved armor, the tank-on-tank -tank combats lasted longer during the offensive, and shots were taken from further away, almost 1,000 yards, compared to earlier, more limited ranges. This is due to the increased firepower of tanks and better, clearer sighting technology, showing how the newer tanks of World War II vastly shifted doctrine from the old tactics of going all-in and driving straight through enemy lines. Ideas tested during World War II affected the design of post-war tanks significantly. These post-war tanks also displayed the split of the East and West during the Cold War era. For example, if we look at the Russian T-54, a small, low tank compared to the more broad M-16, the smaller T-54 Russian profile is due to World War II data, which shows that the smaller your tank, the less likely you are to be shot. The basic idea is survivability onion. Another example of the East versus West split is in the argument of head out versus head in, whose argument goes like this. Have your head out and be more aware, the Western doctrine, or have your head in and be more protected, the Eastern doctrine. These splits showing up in World War II doctrine exemplify the differences in the divergent ways of thinking of the East and West. Both sides, however, had to develop tank manufacturing methods and grow their industrial prowess by the redirecting and organizing of all the resources required to make a tank. Another example of World War II's effect on the future is combined armed doctrine now. Infantry support is now almost always required with a tank or some sort of support vehicle. Why? Well, you can thank the Panzerfaust and the Panzer Shrek, both man-portable anti-tank guns. More recognizable versions may be the RPG, Javelin, and N-Law. These dangerous weapons require tanks to have infantry support or else they can face attacks from anywhere due to these miniature tank destroyers. Especially in cities where modern tank doctrine is to have infantry go ahead and clear buildings before the tank follows in. This is because of the lessons of World War II, when unsupported tanks would become easy pickings for Panzerfaust and Panzer Shrek teams. You can see these ideas in Iraq, where RPGs were threats for all vehicles because of their small, single-man operable nature. Russia's wave doctrine also carries over to modern days, strangely. Looking into the Ukraine-Russian war, we can see the effectiveness of this modern combat field as the Russians continue sending repeated waves of tanks and infantry to Ukraine, with varying effects. However, modern Russia doesn't have the production rate of the Soviet Union, so they are struggling to keep up with the flow. In conclusion, looking at World War II allows us to understand specific decisions in modern military doctrine and where they came from, like you can see in infantry support. Looking into World War II can also predict modern design ideas and the mechanics behind other ideas such as the S-Tank.